And now I just want to speak about this uh, inconvenient truth, <laughs> which was the name of a movie many years ago, which, you know, I'm on Wall Street, and that was like this big thing that came out about climate change. And it's, it has nothing to do with climate change in my discussion today. But, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that all truth is inconvenient to somebody because you don't want to hear it. You know, we, we have all these ways that we calculate in our brain that I can work around it. And this book, you know, it says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, yeah. right? So if you, would you say right now, if you had to vote, is this the authority of the decision-making that you have in your life? 100%? Yeah. All right, well then we have to know what it says. We can't count on other people. Be like the Bereans and ask for help if you're not fully aware of how you apply what's in here to 2022. Because that's one of the first things the atheists say is that this doesn't apply to today. And it takes a spirit-filled group of the remnant that love God to press in and know how to apply it to today. You could take a stand for what's in here, but if you haven't thought it through and, and you haven't been exercising those muscles, ask for help. Call the church. Say, I've, I've had many people tell me over the years, I have a situation on my job and it's become very difficult and I'm having a hard time knowing how to apply scripture. Because look, we work in an area where there's a lot of really smart people. And when you saw the rage that was coming up, it was right out of Psalm 2 about people that, are, that feel like, you can't tell me what to do with my body. Unless I have to tell you you have to take a vaccine, then I can tell you what to do with your body. But we'll leave that conversation for another day. It's not selective. So I'm going to dig in a little bit here. I'll try to kind of pop along the surface on the, on the bigger topics that I want to cover. But hopefully just plant the seed in your heart that when, when we take a stand for the Lord, it's not always going to be convenient. Living by the truth means that your flesh has to die to some things that it wants to do. And that's why fasting and praying and weeping at the altar is not such a bad idea. Because you want the Lord. You, we, we quote it all the time. 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the NIV version says, We are being transformed into the image of God. Believe that? Yeah. You're being transformed now. Not after you die. Yeah, that will be awesome. But we're here now. <laughs> Let's not pray to die. Let's pray to just flourish while we're here. And if there's anything in my character that's not lining up with the perfection that you want for us to have, perfection meaning completeness, not that we'll never make a mistake, but the completeness, then I don't want it in my life. And if it's a blind spot, I might not see it. So you get confronted by people that you know and you trust and, and they tell you the truth and it's inconvenient because it means you might have to make a change. And people don't like change. I don't know. Have you noticed that? People don't like to change. So let's just pray. Lord, we're just grateful for the power of your word, for the authority of scripture over our lives, for this amazing gift of Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and, and between a loving father and the perfect model of Jesus and the word of God, which is we can access freely anywhere, don't even need the book anymore, can be right in our hands. I love the book, but when we don't have it with us, we still have it with us on whatever device we're using. And, and then Holy Spirit being that fuel and that energy in us. Open our eyes for every situation we're in to know how to speak the truth in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Easy to say, speak the truth in love. Not so easy to do it. <laughs> so let's see what he wants us to look at today. In John chapter 14, it says, Jesus was speaking to Thomas and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And in our men's study, we've been really focusing on the Father a lot. Lots of the last few books. That's Thursday mornings, by the way. Any of the men that are here or watching online, you can join us. Just email our info at kingofkingswc.com. We'll get you the link. You can sign in, and it's been awesome. And during that time, I mentioned that one of the things the Lord showed me is that it doesn't say no one comes to God except through the Son. It says no one comes to the Father except through the Son. And as always, it's family language. So you may think God is some angry judge up in the clouds that you're supposed to avoid, but that's not the picture Jesus has for us. It's a loving Father who can't wait to see you, who, who waits for you when you're in the pigsty. He's standing there waiting with a robe and a ring and new sandals. All those things that you might not have understood about the character of God, 
the unconditional love, the shame that the enemy tries to put on us, this is, you get to the Father through the Son. Not the angry God. It's not the bigger picture of people saying, oh, you're so, you, you exclude so many other people because you say Christianity is the only way. Well, let's just drill down a little. The way to the Father is understanding the Son. He wants us to see him as a father and not our earthly father who was flawed, but the perfect father. I don't know how many years we got left, but man, I'll tell you when it shifts in your mind, the remaining time that you have here, when you know that he loves you and he's not just ready to strike you down. Look, Jesus told the woman that was caught in adultery, go and sin no more. That was an inconvenient truth <laughs> because all truth is inconvenient to somebody. Now, it was up to her whether she chose to do that. The, the rich young ruler, Jesus said, you've got to give everything away. And it says he walked away frustrated. That was an inconvenient truth. But Jesus didn't chase him. He didn't water it down. We can't water down the Bible. We can't say, oh, well, you know what, just give up half. You don't have to give it all. Maybe I was being a little too strict. No, Jesus got a word from the Father that this man had to give it all away. It doesn't mean we all have to give everything away. we got to hear the voice of the Lord ourselves. And I was talking to Dave about this one the other day. I love this because it says in the garden, when, when they came to arrest him, they said, where's the one that we're looking for? We're looking for Jesus. And he said, I am he. Now notice, I am is the name of God, right? When he was talking to Moses, what, who should I tell him? I am, you are what? Everything you need, <laughs> whatever you need, right on time. And then they're in the garden, and they're there to arrest him. Who are you looking for? Jesus, I am he, and it, this is great. When he said to them, I am he, they fell like bowling pins in a bowling alley. They fell down on the ground. The power of the word, <laughs> I am. The same voice of God that created the whole universe <clears throat> knocked him over. That's who we serve. And he was voluntarily going to the cross. Could have called down legions of angels. Loved us enough. The joy that was set before him was the person sitting next to you. That includes all of us, just so you know. I'm talking about you too. <laughs> and then the other phrase he gave me was, that we have to say a dangerous yes. <laughs> it's always a dangerous yes. When the Lord says, who am I going to send? Remember from Isaiah? And Isaiah says, here I am. Ignore me. Because <laughs> the number one thing you hear people say is if I say yes to God, he's going to make me a missionary in Africa. Right? Have you heard that? This is like the default setting that people say, no, no, I don't want that. We were in Africa, and we were talking to missionaries, and Trisha said, how long do you have to be here? <laughs> because that is not her call, okay? And, and they said, what do you mean? Like, we love being here, <laughs> right? So that, that's nothing to slight my wife. She's amazing. But that wasn't what God called her to do. And when he calls you to do something, he puts a burden on your heart where you can't think about anything else. It's a dangerous yes on the way in, but that's your fulfillment when you know it's what the Lord told you to do and not your own opinion, right? There's a big difference. <laughs> so John 18, saying the dangerous yes when God calls you and you pick up the phone and he says, are you with me? Yes. <laughs> I know it's risky, but I'd rather live for your purposes than that second-hand version of what the enemy wants to say to me. It's always second-hand. For this cause, Jesus said in John 18, 37, I have come into the world. He's speaking to Pontius Pilate. And it's for this cause that I'm here right now. You're about to execute me. It was for this cause that I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, hears my voice. Anybody hear of the truth? Yeah, yeah amen. Amen. And you always need more of this. So we need more of the truth in our lives too. And that's why we keep praying and asking for revelation. And, well, I already prayed this morning. Well, it's like Paul said, at all times, we can have our ear open. Even while we're in the middle of our day and working and being productive and functioning, you'll be more productive. 
Because the Lord will start dropping ideas in there that you wouldn't have thought of. Because you're tied into the creator of the whole universe. And you know, when you could stay calm under pressure and just trust that he's going to speak to you, you, you don't get rattled. And how many know you don't make good decisions when you're rattled? So it's awesome. And there's that movie Bridge of Spies, and Tom Hanks is the lawyer, and he's looking at this guy accused of spying. And Tom Hanks is like, aren't you worried? Like, if you're found guilty, you're going to be sent back to, to Russia. Aren't you worried? And the guy looks at him and says, would it help? <laughs> no. He knew that. That's the truth. It doesn't help. Getting all wound up is exactly where the devil wants to take you. He wants to hijack you. I'm here for this purpose. Whoever is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate says, what is truth? And that's been a famous saying. And it's, a, it's in contention always in society of what the right way to live is. Who's a good person? How do I become a better person? Who's my model? And we will tell you all day long, every day, the Bible's the authority of your life. Jesus is the perfect human. God is the perfect Father, and he filled us with his spirit. So there's nothing that we need. We, said, we sang it this morning. Everything I need, I already have. But it has to be developed. And whatever's in the way, we, we are glad to, to detox and get rid of it. So I answered just kind of hypothetically, one of the things that's truth is saying yes to God's will when it's easier to say no. Even when it's inconvenient, because it's always inconvenient to somebody, right? We have to change. We don't like it. The reality is, you know, I'll, I'll show you an example, but I love this verse. Colossians 2, 3 says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. <laughs> Nobody wants to die, right? He's not talking about literally dying, but the old person, when you got born again, and baptism is a great, wonderful picture of it, you went under the water and you came up. It was as if the Jews were leaving Egypt and they came through the Red Sea and coming out the other side of that water, they're free people because God destroyed the Egyptian army. So God made you free by destroying the yokes and the chains that were holding you back. Whatever addiction you had, it's not your willpower that broke those chains. It's God's power in you that broke those chains. And that's why AA is the most successful program ever for keeping people off of whatever the addiction is, as long as they stick to Scripture, as long as it's based on the original principles. So I just thought of some examples of all truth is inconvenient to somebody. Uh, here's the first one I thought of. Oh, Lord. You're good, man. You're good. I'd say, wait a minute. This scale is broken. No way is that number right. We need a new scale. <laughs> Trisha's mom, as she was getting older, she lived with us, and her room was right off the kitchen. Once in a while, Trisha would walk in, and she'd see her mom eating candy that she had hidden under her bed. And she'd walk in and talk to her mom. It would be like a squirrel with the acorns in there, <laughs> all the chocolate she was eating. And then she'd come out, and she goes, I don't know. That, that don't make it address is the same way they used to make them. They're way smaller than they used to be. <laughs> we all do this, okay? It's inconvenient. The truth is inconvenient. So we have a scale in the bathroom, but we never get on it. Wow. Oh, that's not a good idea, is it? But, man, it's not fun getting on that thing. That could be a very inconvenient truth. Oh, nobody left. I'm happy. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Here's another one. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am, uh, you were speed. Do you know why I pulled you over? Yeah, because you're a jerk. <laughs> uh, no, ma'am, I have you on radar that you were going uh, like 40 miles over the speed limit. Sorry. Uh, well, your radar machine is broken, clearly, because I was not doing that. Well, okay, we can hassle that one out in court if you want, but at the moment, I need to see your license and registration and your insurance card and not a gun uh, pointing at me. So, look, reality, I heard somebody say, is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> oh, people are going to start leaving. I know it. It's like, I thought I could do 90. Nope, can't do 90. 65, maybe 66, right? You drift a little, but not 90. How about this one? I'm in finance, so I thought of this guy, Bernie Madoff. I mean, thousands of investors 
gave him their life savings. People went from thinking that they were worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and in some cases they were already billionaires. So he fooled. You talk about a dark anointing this guy had on his life. He stole $20 billion from some of the most successful people in the world, and there was nothing left. One lady who was married to a guy who got ripped off gave back like $4 billion. Didn't have to. She just felt so bad for all these people that lost so much. It got to this, they got something back, but boy, you talk about an inconvenient truth, is that you think you've got money in the bank and it evaporated overnight and you had no idea. And then, you know, what, what the average person in the culture says, well, where was God in that situation? Well, look, when we got saved, nobody promised you a rose garden, okay? There's always thorns. Like, it doesn't mean when you get saved, nothing bad ever happens. It means you have a lot more tools to fight it off because you know the truth now, and at least you won't fall victim to the lies, and he'll give you discernment. And you've got a lot of people around here with discernment that you can lean into and say, hey, would you pray with me about this? I'm not asking for your permission, but what does the Lord say to you about this idea that I have? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Oh, no, but the guy told me if I don't do it today, the deal's going to go away. Well, that's a warning sign. If it's a good deal today, it should be a good deal tomorrow. But, man, why do they call it being a con man? Because they build your confidence because they're good liars. Be careful. Go slow. And then there was this song, because I'm a musician, I can't help but think of lyrics to the song. And it was Carol King like the slow version of, will you still love me tomorrow? How many of us have ever asked that question when we were dating somebody? Like, is this a safe relationship? Like, is this guy or this girl going to still be here? And, and the bridge is powerful. It says, tonight with words unspoken, you say that I'm the only one. But will my heart be broken when the night meets the morning sun? <laughs> Inconvenient truth. <laughs> you didn't get Boaz. <laughs> I'm not going where you, what you did get, but it wasn't Boaz. Somebody said Bozo. That's clean. We could say Bozo. But most people think it's something else besides Bozo. I'll leave that one alone. And then the last verse is, I'd like to know that your love is love I can be sure of. So tell me now, and I won't ask again. Yes, you will. <laughs> will you still love me tomorrow? And then right in the song, she says, So tell me now, and I won't ask again. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. <laughs> will you still love What does Jesus say? Yes. Yes. Tomorrow. Fall in love with me. And then Boaz, don't look like the hero anymore. You want a Boaz for sure. Beats the alternatives. But when you know that this is the most important relationship in, in your spouse's life, wow, that takes a whole bunch of stuff off the table. Oh, thank you, Lord. No love like the love of God, the unconditional love of God. And people will let you down. You can't be looking for fulfillment from people. It's got to be from God. And then, look, we're all here together. My wife and I decided a long ago we're going to stick this thing out. No matter what happens, we're going to make it work because he gave us all the tools that we need. Does that mean you have some inconvenient truths? Yeah. God's bigger. God's bigger. Thank you, Nate, for being honest. So I just said answer in the call for God's dangerous yes. And you look that one up, and I'll get there. But look, let's just think about some people in the Bible. One of them is Abraham. And I remember as a new Christian when I was reading the Bible, I was just, you know, asking the normal questions that people ask. And I heard about Abraham. God said, I want you to offer the very son that you were praying for that I gave you, this miracle child, I want you to now offer him up on, on the altar. And it seemed like such a disconnect. Anybody else besides me think that when you first read it? One person willing to admit it? Thanks, Jen. <laughs> So it's like, what were you thinking, God? Like, how could you ask him to do that? 
And long story short, he was obedient, and we could read in other portions of Scripture, and, and I'll get to that. But in Genesis 22, the, the main reason he's one, considered one of the fathers of faith is because he was obedient. It said it was imputed to him for righteousness. He was righteous. He was in right standing before God because he knew how to hear God's voice, and he obeyed it even when it looked like it wasn't God. How many would like to do that better? I sure would. How about Moses? You really feel sorry for this guy after a while when you're reading through the Old Testament. It's like, man, he said at one point, God, if you love me, just kill me. I didn't ask for this job. These people just never stop complaining. So, and then it was really like, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? Like, you keep making it harder on this guy. He said yes to you, and you keep making it harder. Anybody else on that one willing to admit it? Okay, a few honest people here. And then... I thought of the verse that says, where there is no revelation or prophetic vision, and you might have heard it, where there is no vision, people perish. But in this version, it said, where there's no revelation or prophetic revelation is what the Passion Translation says, people cast off restraint. Yeah. How about America right now? Does it look like people are casting off restraint? Yeah. Like, I mean, they're blowing up every rule that's out there. And you know, even if they shoot for the sun and they land on the moon, you know, like if you want to think about the trans dancers being told that they have to come to school. Like, I don't know. No, thanks anyway, but I'll, I'll pass on that opportunity. But it's being made into law in some places in the name of equality. Uh, we need prophetic vision and revelation on a daily basis to be able to navigate all the landmines that, that the world's putting up all around us. So we'll talk about that too. And then it says, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Hmm. That's the truth. Wisdom's instruction. Knowledge is one thing. That's having all the facts. Wisdom is knowing how to apply what you know to your daily living and your daily circumstances. And look around you. There's some very seasoned people in the room. So if you're not sure, we can ask the audience. Remember that one? Millionaire? I think they're not, almost never wrong. It's amazing. What a great gift that is to say you can ask the audience. So you could do the same thing. You're part of a tribe here. You're part of people who love you. Even people that aren't in the local area, they email us all the time for advice. Why wouldn't you try that? Because I already know it. I don't need help on this one. Oh, boy, the devil loves that one. <laughs> Romans 4. How about Abraham's dangerous yes? And being not weak in faith, it says in Romans chapter 4, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God. Man, that, that ne I never forgot that verse. The first church I was being taught the Bible was King James only. <laughs> and that's a great verse right there. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. He wasn't weak in faith. It says in verse 19, he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. That's the summary version. We'll talk a little more about the detail. And then Moses had a bunch of dangerous yes answers. <laughs> By faith, Moses, when he was grown, he refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He was, he was royalty. He was raised by Pharaoh's family. And nope, I'm refusing those privileges. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than a soft life of sin with the oppressors. Leave it to Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, to get right to the point. Some hard choices. Some inconvenient truths to say I'm a follower of Jesus and the Bible is the authority over my life. I might not be the most popular person on my job because I'll, I'll take a stand about things that they might not agree with. But you know what? You only get one shot in this life and I'm taking a stand for the truth. That's what I believe. There was a Christian professor at a university and, and he was the head of the philosophy department and a, and a young student came up and said, please tell me, I heard that you're a follower of Jesus. Please tell me it's not true. And he said, awesome answer. Oh, yeah, it's true. Who else did you have in mind? Because we're all following something. And he was the head of the whole philosophy department. So he knew every other 
color on that rainbow. And he said, my vote goes down on Jesus. You got something? Persuade me. What would you like to talk about? It's like, Jesus. They asked him no more questions after that. <laughs> it was an inconvenient truth. <laughs> He valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead, anticipating the payoff. Not just heaven when you die. That's a great payoff. But the abundant life that you can have right now, the eternal kind of life you can live while you're living. You don't have to wait to die till you have eternal life. It's living by the authority of, of the word and Jesus as my example and a loving father and the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of life we're going to have for eternity. So if we choose to diverge, fine, you made a choice. That's an inconvenient truth, isn't it? Sorry, I'm saying that a lot. By an act of faith, he turned his heel on Egypt, indifferent to the king's blind rage. He had his eye on the one no eye can see. And kept right on going. By an act of faith, he kept Passover feasts, sprinkled the Passover blood on each house so that the destroyer of the firstborn wouldn't touch them. By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Anybody happy about that one? I like this part. The Egyptians tried it and drowned. <laughs> so then you get back to this question, like Isaiah 46 10 says, God speaking, I declare the end from the beginning. God never starts at the beginning. He already knows the end from the beginning. We don't know the end from the beginning, but he wants us to have a teachable spirit and an ear open to, to know his voice. My sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So we have to know when it's us and when it's the devil and when it's God. It's usually not that hard. <laughs> I'll leave that alone. We'll figure that one out another day. But he says, I declare the end from the beginning and ancient times from what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and all my good pleasure I will accomplish. Yeah. So we can go back on those questions. Why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Is because... I would say almost like to think of the Navy SEALs. And if you know anything about it, they have to go through Hell Week. Anybody know what you do if you want to quit during Hell Week? You ring the bell. And the more I studied that whole thing and met one of the Navy SEALs, powerful, amazing people, it's because they have to test for seven days with no sleep and, and brutal physical conditions. They have to see if there's any possibility that you would quit in the worst battle of, of your life. And it could be seven days while, while you're in a battle. If you're outnumbered by the enemy, they can keep shifting who's fighting you. You might have to be awake seven days. And if you would quit, that means I can't have you on my team. Everybody that makes it through that training will not quit. No man left behind. Doesn't mean they're gonna win every fight. But you know, Dutch Sheets has this great saying, you gotta know who you're gonna go to lunch with and who you're gonna go to war with. And they would only go to war with people who made it through Hell Week. Okay, so, and this might seem unfair of God, but if he wants to trust us as leaders in the church, we have to be trustworthy. And you could look at all the scandals that have happened is that people start off with, they start off well, but there's some crack in, in the foundation, there's some crack in the structure, and then people who you never would have thought, like Ravi Zacharias as a, as a recent example, he, you know, he would have been used as, as one of the people you would want to defend the power of Scripture. And yet there was a whole dark side, many others we don't even have to name. I can't worry about them, I gotta look in the mirror. And he's going to say to me, how well are you taking care of my children? And how well are you taking care of my daughter, your wife? She's my daughter before she's your wife. Boy, why'd you have to say that? It was an inconvenient truth. Uh, I, you can read up on Abraham's life. It's amazing. It says that he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. All those years before the resurrection, all those years before any of what we would consider normal things a Christian would know, he knew that that child came out of nothing, and if God brought him out of nothing, God could raise him from the dead. 
That's the kind of faith that is considered righteousness before God. Even when it looks like exactly what the heathen would do, sacrifice your child. And before he brought the knife down, God said, that's good. You made it through hell week. <laughs> You're a Navy SEAL. I can trust you. You won't quit. Doesn't mean you won't make a mistake, but I know you won't quit. Moses too. Woo. Why did God harden the heart? Pharaoh's heart and caused Moses so much grief because God knew the end from the beginning. Moses didn't know. We know the Israelites sure didn't know because all they did was moan and complain and it was never good enough. And you brought us, we want our leeks. <laughs> Whoever would have thought you'd be asking for leeks? But they were leaking all of their complaining. Not good. Read it. Not good. Be grateful. Thank God in every situation. Thank God. It says in the New Testament, for all things, be grateful. Wow. So here's the deal. All those plagues come down, and Pharaoh gets upset, and he says they can go, and then he changes his mind. Another plague, another plague, another plague. Then they're on the run, and he changes his mind again. Now, God knew the end from the beginning. God heard Miriam singing the song on the other side before she even knew there was going to be a song. But Moses didn't know that. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about in your own life when God asked you to do something that seemed really hard and just out of faith? By faith, I'm going to take this step of faith, even though it doesn't add up and all the people that aren't Christians are telling me it's a stupid idea. But did you ask some Christians that you trust, that have discernment, that will pray about it? Oh, maybe not. Why not? Well, I don't know why not. They're all around me in church every Sunday, so that was a bad move on my part ask. What was the end result? Every Egyptian soldier was wiped out by the water. They didn't have to lift a finger. And he said that while they were still on the other side of the river. Stand still and watch the power of God operate in your life. So even though we don't see it, he's working. I can't help it. I quote songs all the time. He's the way maker. Get it? Even when we don't feel it, he's working. You didn't know that song. I thought you would have known it. Blessed is the one who heeds wisdom and instruction. I'm going to wind it down now. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So one of the dangerous yes answers to God is, I will be a king and a priest in, in your kingdom. I'm enrolling for the Navy SEAL training. And you're going to give me heaven week, not hell week. <laughs> because everything that's going on in heaven, I'm allowed to do. But everything that's going on out here in the world, sin. It's all been stained by sin. So I'm willing to allow you to mold me into who you want me to be. And if something has to go, I'm willing to take that idol down in my life. They get pretty tricky sometimes, and we teach on that separately, but... You know, you're accepting authority. The ecclesia was a governing body of people. The church, the word for church is ecclesia. It's not just the family portion, which is awesome. We need that. But it's also the governing and ruling authority that we have. And when we took authority over those clouds yesterday, they didn't come near us. And one of the guys was taking the screenshots. And it was saying, in a half hour, this massive cloud was going to come over us and start raining. And he kept taking the screenshots because they kept going a different way. Okay, well, if you don't know you have the authority, you think, well, that's not, that doesn't happen anymore. What? If it's in the Bible, why wouldn't it still happen? There's no more demons in the world? Oh, you don't need the Holy Spirit. Deliverance isn't for today because there's no more demons. Come visit us in New Jersey. Drive on Route 3 by Giant Stadium. <laughs> After the trauma counseling you get, let's talk about demons. <laughs> I'm winding down as that beautiful music comes from the back. Will you still love me? <laughs> yes, he will. Hebrews 5.2, Jesus can have compassion on those who are, raise your hand, ignorant and weak. Anybody? I'm the only one going astray. Even as Christians, we can be ignorant and going astray. We could lack revelation. God sees the end from the beginning. I'm only seeing the next step, and it looks really, looks a little scary. 
since he himself is also subject to weakness. Now, I couldn't, I was wrestling with that. What do you mean? Jesus subject to weakness? And then I looked up the, the Greek, and, and one of the translations is yoked. And that really cleared it up for me. Like, now all of a sudden he said, yoke up with me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He chose to yoke up with Peter. Even Peter wasn't the best ox in the, in the stall. Woo! He yoked himself to me. He made himself part of a weak thing to bring his strength into me. He's able. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is connected to you who is weak and he's not. And he volunteered to do that. So he has compassion for us. Because of this, he's required to offer sacrifices for sin. Not because he sinned, but because he's yoked to us and we sin. No man takes this honor to himself, the priesthood, but he who is called by God. Are you called by God into the priesthood? The answer is yes. Inconvenient truth? Maybe. It's who he's called us to be. We're going to rule and reign with him for eternity. All right? Whether you like it or not, you're going to love it when you get there. Doesn't matter what people said about you for your whole life. Doesn't matter what class you were in in school, what college you didn't get into. He's the leveler. He's the leveler of all of that stuff. You matter to him. And he wants you to fit what he made you to be right here. Powerful. Not compared to anybody else. You. Hmm. No man takes this honor, but it's called by God to be a priest. So also Christ didn't glorify himself to become the high priest, but it was he who said, you are my son. God, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. We got adopted into that family. Verse 7 says, who in the days of his flesh, when he was offered up prayer, he was praying to the Father in the garden of Gethsemane, prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, not my will. We willing to say that. Yeah, it takes a Navy SEAL. Not my will, but yours be done, even when I don't know what the outcome is gonna be. But I know your voice, and I'm gonna do what you tell me to do. And see where it ends. I know, I'm, I'm on your side, Lord. Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And he suffered because he yoked himself to us, and he could feel what it would be like to be tempted. He couldn't sin, but he was tempted to sin. I shouldn't say that. He could have sinned, what I meant to say. He was tempted, but he never gave in to that temptation. What a savior. Oh, my God. He allowed himself to be tempted just like me and you and never fell. What an example. And this is it, last portion of scripture. Oh, in the voice, I, I just recommend read the voice sometimes. It's amazing. And some of the ways they pull out the truth. Verse 3 in Philippians 2 says, Don't let selfishness and prideful agendas take over. Embrace true humility. Lift your heads to extend love to others. Get beyond yourself and protecting your own interests. Be sincere. Secure your neighbor's interests first. In other words, adopt the mindset of Jesus. Live with his attitude in your heart. Remember, though he was in the form of God, he chose not to cling to equality with God, but he poured himself out to fill a vessel brand new. Wow, that's us. We're the vessel. Stand up, okay? And lift your hands. And this is him saying, I poured myself out to fill your vessel. A brand new you. New wine for a new wineskin. I will sing unto the Lord because he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider fell into the sea. That whole Egyptian army wiped out. They never had to raise a weapon. He knew the end from the beginning. Moses probably wanted to kill these people half the time. But he was obedient to God. Wow. Fill a vessel. I am the vessel brand new, Lord, that you want to fill. In a servant in form and a man in his actions, in his deeds. The very likeness of humanity. He humbled himself, obedient to death 
a merciless death on the cross. Therefore, don't cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Can you look at somebody and say, don't cast away your confidence? You might have walked in here discouraged about something today, but don't cast away your confidence. There's a great reward in that confidence in God. Not in you, but in God coming through for you. You will, Lord. You will come through for us. We might have to make some tough decisions. That goes with the territory. That's life, period. When you got the Lord, man, he'll get you through. For you need endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you'll receive the promise that he gave. And can we read this out loud together? Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now put your name in here and say, let me not grow weary. <laughs> All right, ready? Let me not grow weary while doing good, for in due season I shall reap if I do not lose heart. And that's our prayer, Lord, today. Let's lift your hand to the Lord. Lord, we're not going to get weary. We're not going to cast away our confidence, Lord. We trust in you. The enemy might have us down. He thinks down for the count, but I'm getting back up again. This fight is not over because I'm not the only one fighting. It's not my strength that sustains me. It's your strength in me that sustained me. So I humble myself. I take on that form that Jesus had, and I trust you to be the one to carry me over. I'm not afraid of inconvenient truth. I love your word. And as your truth gets revealed to me, let me integrate it into my life and purge out all the toxic stuff. Whatever's still there, I want it out that I could be more like you and reflect your glory in everything I do. And that's a prayer for everyone here from me to you, is that today you'll be more like Jesus than you were yesterday, and tomorrow you'll be more like him than you were today. Amen? Sounds like a song by Stevie Wonder. I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. <laughs> So, Lord, I bless your people right now. I thank you for this tribe, this remnant tribe that's willing to sit for two hours in a church service because they want to hear you and they want to know you. Fill them, Lord. Fill that new vessel of who we are with your power and your presence that we might walk in the fullness of who you made us to be, but also be your ambassadors who are walking not with fancy arguments, but the demonstration of your power in Jesus' name.